Welcome to the, this uh, assess meeting on January 20th. Uh, we're going to start with discussing topics worth discussing of part, uh, uh, proposals worth discussing and uh, leading to the next TC39 meeting. Um, Mark, you have a list of proposals. Yeah, the, the, the main one is, um, oh, Daniel's joining us. Uh, let us reconsider what yes. our topics are. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, Daniel. Your audio is connecting. Still connecting. <laughs> uh, strong start today. Yep. <laughs> Daniel, if you can hear us, you might want to disconnect and try reconnecting. That might go faster than continuing to wait. So, um, oh, we have a Daniel. Uh, hello. Hello. Oh, good. So today's agenda is module bundles, web bundles, um, uh, and uh, uh, the equality operator with regard to tuples, tuples, um, and also uh, if we have time uh, at the, the hind side of the meeting, um, proposals that uh, we've in the past been asked to review for the upcoming TC39 meeting. Um, are you, uh, are oh, you wow. I'm, I'm so sorry for being late for a meeting that was about the topics I put on the agenda. It's, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, we were we were just about to start. Um, the um, are are we ready to talk about bundles or equality in tuples? I'm I'm ready. I can't speak for the groups. Uh, well, we are ready. Are you ready? Yes, <laughs> I'm ready. Awesome, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> great, so which one do you wanna start with? Uh, it's your prerogative. Okay, so uh, let's talk about bundles. Um, I'm actually right now in the middle of writing a new version of the document about bundles. Uh, I, could, I could share like a very early rough copy with you if you want, but Basically, the one one of the core goals of bundles is to work through the problem where it's too high overhead to make an HTTP request for each JavaScript module. So I'm really interested in JavaScript modules, native JavaScript modules shipping on the web and in other environments. And we keep seeing this pattern where it's not high enough performance to do that, so people use bundlers. And but when you look into the bundler space, there's kind of a lot more to the problem. There's also uh, code splitting, making sure that um, you're not delivering code that's not necessary yet. And there's also uh, versioning. There's this technique called cache busting where you end up uh, renaming the URL uh, when the version changes. And then you have to do that up the tree so that um, so that you're not, I mean, so that you can use long lived uh, cache control directives, but then still change it when you need, because you you can change the, the entry point, the root of it, it in the HTML that has sort of a, that's uncached. Yep. And so uh, I think I'm gonna quickly upload the, the version that I have here locally, and then we can, talk through it, but um, the idea is, so the idea becomes uh, something like, um, how can we chunk up the, the resources into bundles? There's also a question of, should we include JavaScript resources and non-JavaScript resources? And so Chris, you mentioned you're interested in non-JavaScript resources as well. 
I was wondering if we could dig into that and then we could talk about the other issues. The, the core sort of um, semantic property that people have talked about preserving is preserving uh, URL semantics and preserving kind of what it means to be resources on the web. So uh, why don't we first talk about these, the application requirements and then we can talk about these, these constraints. And then at the end, we could talk about the, the design of something that meets all the, the goals. So um, if you have something to project. I'm, I'm working on getting something up to project. If in the meantime, someone can say where they've, if you've run into this problem before yourselves, oh. then that would be, <laughs> that would be great. Now would be a great time to, to say so. Sure. Uh, I can say that from my experience, I wrote a common JS bundler for, Mo for Motorola many years ago and ran into all of the same things that you're discussing, that, that you're mentioning. The only thing I didn't do was tree shaking. Um, and uh, tree shaking is complicated. Um, the, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like in this space, there isn't one perfect solution, right? It, it depends, of, uh, much depends upon what you want uh, to achieve. And um, like if we could have a perfect solution, maybe that's something that could come out of this conversation, but it would be, um, uh, it, it, it would be a stretch this, the, the, because there are a whole bunch of things that run across purposes, right? So if you're, if you're talking about minimizing the footprint of, uh, of, the, app, uh, of, the, of the first slice of an application to get the, the, you know, the, the, first, the, uh, the time to first behavior uh, down, then yeah, you need code splitting. Ideally, you'd also do tree shaking. Ideally, you'd also bundle all of your scripts like Rollup does and erase the module system entirely. Um, and uh, and the outcome of that is a large uncacheable artifact. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, uh, it, 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 it runs across purposes because if you wanted to do um, because well okay if you do that you can do tree shaking you can actually get your bundle small but it's uncacheable and also plays poorly with code splitting right because, or, or or rather plays poorly with dynamic import later like you can do tree shaking only if you are absolutely certain that <laughs> <laughs> oh no it's chris is all the way down <laughs> Um, thank you for the Sorry. feedback. I, I always appreciate strong feedback. <laughs> I'm just waiting so that I can present. Uh... <laughs> uh -oh. That's on the record. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, well, in any case, you can only do tree shaking if you're sure that nobody's ever going to load a module that needs something that that module exported that you shook out of the tree, um, which is to say that you can't really have dynamic import and also tree shaking. <laughs> yeah, I think I think tree shaking kind of inherently. I, I agree with you that it's kind of a thing that you have to be opinionated about because you end up having to be unsound in some way or other to, to do it to the extent that people want it to be done. But uh, the other parts about running native JavaScript modules and um, and code splitting and uh, you know in particular to make dynamic import work seem seem pretty core. So I linked in the chat. I linked to a HackMD about with my kind of draft of requirements. So I'm glad that Michael Saboff is here because I've also been talking with with Apple about this and I included in this some sort of alternatives that they're, um, that they express some preference to. So there's, there was the question about whether we want to include JavaScript, just JavaScript resources or, or more than ju just JavaScript resources. So if we include just JavaScript resources, we could do the indirection at the module map level. Uh, you know, if there's a question about us sending bundles, the bundles could be entries in the 
I mean, each entry in the bundle could be an entry in the module map, or it could be at the level of fetching resources. So my, my impulse to handle all the different uh, kinds of data types that might be involved is to do it at the fetch level rather than at the module map level. Uh, WebAssembly might be doable if we're in if we're doing this at the module map level because we have WebAssembly modules, but those are those are actually not not reality yet, and it's not clear whether they'll meet everyone's requirements. Um, I would I would I would prefer to proceed optimistically and then fall back if we need to. Optimistically, meaning the the fetch level. Meaning at the module level, assuming that WebAssembly modules become modules, assuming oh. that the researchers are interested in become modules. Uh, uh, we have I want to assume that WebAssembly modules can become modules, but there's other things like images or fonts that are not yeah. supposed to become modules. So I, if if binary data can be a module, and and a tech and text can be a module, and JSON can be a module. Uh, and WASM is a module, I think that pretty much covers it. So we have this thing called HTML that can then make these references to, uh, to resources. Those resources are not looked up in the module map, but there is an idea to have an import URL scheme where you could, you know, instead of doing HTTP colon, you do import colon, and then you would put a module specifier after that. Uh, I, I don't really know how practical this was. It was included in the import match proposal initially, but then it was pulled out because. Uh, so would the, the things that are importable by HTML uh, also be importable as modules by JavaScript? In theory, but it may. Cross language. So the, this import colon URL scheme would, would, the idea of that would be that it would match how modules are, how module specifiers are resolved. I think resolving a module specifier is a different operation from actually importing it. So in theory, it could be more tolerant. For example, it could permit, we could permit images this way and have them be indirected through import maps. Um, that presumes that the HTML itself is effectively a module that has, uh, a module specifier that can be used as a referrer, et cetera, right? So last I heard, it was the base URL for the document that was being looked at. And in general, when people have talked about these import uh, scheme URLs, I was part of why it got removed, actually. Um, when they've talked about them, in general, either they want you to reference something Absolutely, which is a little bit strange, but basically like Dan is saying, it would go through a mapping operation through an import map or policy or something like that, and then be resolved to an absolute location. Um, so, yeah. So I, I feel like the optimistic direction is kind of on the other side. I feel like it's optimistic to, to see if we can do bundling at the, at the fetch level, which will solve the broader problem. But um, some WebKit team members raised the concern that it might be too slow to implement in practice. And so I was, I was imagining to start with the fetch version, and try out a sample implementation and see if it can work. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Mark. Uh, it's certainly, I would, I, it's certainly an experiment worth trying and invest, you know, something to be investigated and understood and, uh, to, uh, and then we have a basis for comparison. Yeah. So kind of as a broader part, I see this as part of the broader project of like making native JavaScript work. Like we have this stack of tools, tools are good. They provide value, but it would be nice if you could also use the, the built-in thing kind of directly. And so built-in modules is kind of part of this. And um, I don't know, we talked about guards before or decorators, things that, you know, constructs that programmers use, having them be in the language and having bundling be in the platform. I see that as kind of part of this, so you don't have to emulate JavaScript modules all over the place. Is this kind of the, 
I mean, so for something like compartments, if compartments have these module APIs, if everyone's emulating modules, they're not going to go through any of the compartment hooks, that kind of thing. Right. I mean, that's that's why the I mean, we've we've made all of this investment that's not a language specific investment in a uh, flexible module, you know, resolution and linkage system. Um, and uh, we've already, because of WASM and JSON, uh, already kept our eye on making sure that it could be, you could do cross language linking of modules. Uh, I think uh, Chris has done, you know, fantastic work on, um, uh, you know, working out the semantics of that and coming up with a way for it to be user extensible to new kinds of modules by virtue of the API of the static module record. Uh, it, you know, uh, the extensibility applies only to modules that don't have a live binding semantics. And I think live binding is something that should, where JavaScript should be the first and last language that has live binding. I think it was just a terrible mistake we can't work our way out of, but the thing that's going to enable this thing to work across languages is the non-live binding semantics. WASM already is committed to a semantics without live binding. And of course, it's not an issue for JSON. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, there was some interest in WASM and having live bindings for, for like exported globals. But instead, those are exported as like a first class object that has, you can read and write to. Exactly. I don't know if WASM is committed. It's like stage two in, in WASM land. We need, we need a draft implementation to get that to the next stage. But this thing about it, you're, you're just exporting an object, a mutable object, rather than yeah. exporting a location uh, is kind of the, the essence of it, is, is that that's the way anything that wants something, you know, wants to, to for example, accommodate um, mutual recursion across modules can do it with exported objects rather than something like live bindings. And they can emulate all the power of live bindings by doing that. Um, uh, in any case, uh, my, my point is that, that you know, we're already invested in that. We're already um, going to be building a lot of mechanisms to support that. Uh, it would be, I think, um, you know, if HTML independently does you know, URL mappings and, and, and all sorts of, of you know, import namespace manipulation and basically encounters a similar set of problems and comes up with similar sets of solutions, all of which are disjoint and you have the complexity of two separate um, solution mechanisms to what are really abstractly the same underlying problem, I think that would be a shame. I, um, I agree that it would be a shame if there were duplication. So there was, there was an idea to do bundling. So we could do bundling at the module level or we could do it <clears throat> at the level that underlies modules. You know, for every module system, there's a way to logically kind of fetch the module. Maybe all the modules are, are there on the system already, but there's a way to, to you know, host resolve the, the module. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's sort of a store that these that these come from. Yeah. I hope that whatever mechanism we decide for bundling makes sense across different environments is not just entirely web specific. And that was that's kind of one of the design goals here. That's Right. A little hard to so, talk yeah, about that, there are many different things you're ranging over. Uh, so so yeah. if, I, if I may, um, the uh, if we want, so the only, so my take on this is that the only solution to bundling that's going to have, have su sufficient coverage to cover all of the use cases for which it's necessary would have to come from the fetch level, right? Look, okay, this isn't necessarily true, but my, my perception on the relationship between HTML and modules is that HTMLs at the moment, uh, farewell, Sala. Uh, the, uh, the relationship between HTML and modules is that the ship has sort of sailed for HTML files to be modules. Um, and if we did make HTML, if we did try to, to tack on some sort of module like semantics for HTML, like Bradley was suggesting, like using the base URL as a module specifier, that introduces too much coupling in the module spot specifier namespace, right? Because then they become fully qualified URLs unconditionally. And that I think is acceptable to some, but I think also 
definitely not acceptable to others. Uh, like, for example, Modable is never going to buy fully qualified URLs as their module identifier namespace um, in an excess context. Um, or it I know that they're not like, doing that now, but what, 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 why is that a showstopper for, mod, for Modable? I have not really so heard of it. Uh, is it a showstopper, but it certainly it's... would be undesirable from my perspective. So um, put that in perspective, we added uh, we did compute URLs for our common JS files recently, and it added a good 20% of CPU time if you throw an error uh, generating the stack uh, for each error uh, versus just having a straight file path. I didn't understand that. Ultimately, I think there, there will probably be some differences in how bundling works based on the underlying IO system. So this, this bundling idea points to a, you know, a particular binary format that I think should work in several contexts, but I can't assert that it would work in, in all contexts. It, there could be some environments where you want to use JavaScript, where you want to bundle things in a, in a way that's more efficient for that, that kind of context. Um, sorry, interpreted Bradley. Right. So I think, so my perspective is that if I were to gaze into my crystal ball, if there's, I do think that there is eventually a story for something like HTML, but is a module, but I don't think it's the HTML we have today. Um, and uh, that it's better to have a, to better have a more fundamental solution for bundling that the, uh, that compartments, et cetera, and mod module systems in general can ride on top of. Um, in order to decouple the problem of eventually making modular modular HTML like components, um, because I think that's an open design space uh, that that we will that future generations will want to revisit <laughs> and and not and not be coupled to the exact semantics of what HTML has today. Um, so and just it, to, inter to understand what your position is by analogy, uh, in the same way that in JavaScript. Um, uh, we had scripts, we introduced modules, but we did not retroactively rationalize scripts as kinds of modules. We just continue to support scripts as something outside the module system. Is it sort of the same thing for existing HTML versus HTML modules? My feeling exactly, yes. Okay. The current drafts for HTML modules are more like, are, are a bit different from that because it's, they're more like the main page is not an HTML module. And then from inside of a JavaScript module or, or script with dynamic import, you can import an HTML module. So the, there's, unlike modules, which you can use directly with script type equals module, the current proposal for HTML modules can only be used when bootstrapped by legacy HTML. So that, that could change in the future, but that's the current proposal for HTML modules. Yeah, it's, I, it's a very conservative proposal. It hasn't been, it hasn't achieved consensus. Yeah, I th I think that there, I think that there is a very different idea about what it, uh, about. I I think that there is a very different future post compartments that will emerge. Something that will emerge from compartments is the possibility of a rich ecosystem where CSS, HTML, and JavaScript are all reimagined as modular in a shared module namespace and have appropriate linkage that makes sense that's rational across those boundaries. The project I did for Motorola was something like that. The way we did it was compiling something that looked like HTML to a JavaScript file um, and then allowing it to, to, to uh, participate in the module system in that way. Um, the uh, I'd love to revisit that sometime, you know, maybe in my next life. <laughs> but do you think that uh, having a bundling solution will help us sort of bootstrap our way into that to get people a little bit more uh, in, yeah. in this position? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it, it. I think it's orthogonal, but it would help. And um, but more pressingly, I think that we can't wait for that future to solve the problem. Right, like the bundling, the uh, having a bundling solution is orthogonal to all of that, um, and far more pressing. And, and we need to; it needs to be solved for the script and HTML layer, um, and 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 then use that to overshadow everything else uh, going forward. 
but I'll also recognize that it will be significantly harder to solve at that layer than it would be to bolt onto the module system. So can we get some clarity on what we actually need to support these bundles that Dan has laid out in a document? Well, because I have... right now we're talking about if things should or shouldn't be modules, but we haven't talked about what the bundle actually provides. Okay, let me present because I have like requirements and constraints listed in the, the um... Please do. Um... My thoughts are if we satisfy all the constraints with features, uh, we will better understand if we need to do anything at all. That's, that's a good point. I think not doing anything at all is a legitimate possible outcome of this investigation. I, I don't think it's the ideal one, but it would be a good starting point. It, it's yeah. certainly the outcome that has happened every time I've seen this discussed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have two ways of doing this today. We have, um, you know, we have bundlers and, uh, we have individual responses and individual responses have all kinds of overhead. So some, some constraints, some kind of semantic constraints on HTTP and URLs. One is the origin model. Uh, bundling has gotten mixed up in this whole signed exchange debate. Uh, I don't believe in signed exchange. I would propose that bundles represent things in the same origin. Did, More you, did you say signed exchange? Yeah, sign exchange is like the AMP thing where, you know, Google can scoop up all the TLS internet and serve it under, you know, from its servers because it like does the proper signature dance that it agrees with itself about. And um, you basic, basically force itself as a CDN on everybody and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it makes sense for origins to choose their own CDN instead. So then there, more subtly, there's a path restriction. So service workers only work within the, they're only able to like intercept and change responses for things in the same enclosing directory. And I think that kind of restriction makes sense for bundles as well. because they're a little bit like a declarative service worker, but even more tightly identity correspondence it should be, this was a constraint that Brave raised. It should be that if you fetch something from inside a bundle, you would have gotten the same response as if you fetched it like normally. So each thing that is inside the bundle will have just a completely normal URL that you could fetch individually. <coughs> and browsers could use this to make sure that bundles are, are well behaved in kind of a stochastic way maybe. And it, this is important. I mean, the, the concept behind this is that bundles are not personalized. They're for the static part of the site, like most of the JavaScript code. Though you might not, the, the subsection that you download might not always be static, but the, the resources are, you know, you would have gotten them the same way if you got it independently. So I, then um, for web developers, I think we want to make this fit into people's existing flows. So people use bundlers today and they have code splitting mechanisms and asset reference mechanisms. And also, you know, some things they do are standard, some things are not standard. <laughs> that could all just work. For servers, it has to be implementable on servers. We can't do something that's too expensive or impractical to implement or uh, take a lot of extra work to do to, uh, you know, logic or state. And hopefully deployment stays for static content stays like you just copy certain static files onto the server. For browsers, the constraints that I know about are, well, it would be nice if graceful degradation works. One way that it could work is if we say that the underlying contents need to be there in the same way, that's sort of the completely correct graceful degradation. Sometimes that will be too slow and you might want to feature detect this at runtime and fall back to some, you know, legacy emulated bundling solution if 
it's not if it's not there. And also, it needs to be implementable in, in browsers, which was a, a concern that that um, was raised in the WebKit team that this solution by emulating at the fetch level might be too difficult to implement in a performant way. But that's something to maybe try out. So the, the privacy constraint was personalization. So Brave's post was all about potential for scrambling URLs, making URLs less meaningful. And the meaning, it's <coughs> meaningful URLs are important for, for ad blockers or content blocking in general, because they need to be able to, um, you know, put regular expressions against those URLs to determine what not to render. And you can, you know, tut tut your head all day about how that technique is not meaningful or something, but it, it works today and it would be nice for it to not break. Um, <coughs> also for content blocking, when those content blockers block URLs, they avoid the overhead of downloading that content that's linked to it. It would be great if we could avoid that overhead for bundling as well. If bundling weren't a thing that made everybody incur that overhead. I think this ultimately comes back to the same thing as, as code splitting. And of course the origin model uh, would also be, if we broke that, that would also be bad for, for content blocking. So I have my, uh, well, I barely started to sketch the solution. And then I have a long FAQ of like various design decisions that I made but didn't sketch out above. I don't know if, if do people have thoughts about the motivation and constraints? So uh, I think the ad blocking thing is just fascinating. Um, uh, I you know I use an ad blocking browser. I use Brave in particular. Uh, I really like the fact that it's not only that it's less visual distraction, but it's less download and delay. Um, uh, but it's a it's a very very challenging use case with regard to these architectural issues uh, because it's. Um, adversarial because the, you know, we might say we want URLs that we can do regular expression filtering on, but the provider of the ad combined with the uh, provider of the content that the ad is an add on uh, and all the intermediaries between the two uh, are all trying to get the ad displayed despite the ad blocking thing and we can't force them to keep their URLs stable and filterable and they have an incentive not to. So it's, 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 a, it's just a fascinating, weird thing to take as constraining on other architecture when it's, when it's really just a, an arms race yeah. where we can't enforce the constraints on them that well, will make ad blocking continue to be meaningful. Uh, but they, you know, but regular expression based content blocking does work in, in practice, even as surprising as, as it is. So that's so, the, so the, why does I want to say that this was this was developed with a lot of help from Brave in a very long conversation with them over months where we kind of clarified the various points here. They haven't reviewed this particular draft, but it, it the ad blockers continue to work despite this incentive because it is impractical to fully subvert the user's will. Uh, but, but both, but it's uh, it's impractical and not worth the trouble because the, the people who are using ad blockers have made a very strong statement by using ad blockers that they want them to work. Um, <laughs> that they that they that if it were if they were confounded they would take their business elsewhere. Um, I, I rather than finish my thought, Bradley, you have a your hand up. Uh, for later, a different topic. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 you know, I want to make clear, I'm not against ad blocking. I'm not against figuring out what we can do to support them. Uh, uh, I, I use ad blockers. I value them, uh, but I don't understand why the current solutions work as well. And I certainly am skeptical that there's a long-term case that they will continue to work. 
Right. So the, the, the reason for that today, and you're, you're absolutely right, it could change any moment, depending on the calculus of how of, of the price of compute, I think, is a big piece of why they work today. Uh, it's not practical to generate a bespoke bundle for every user. If it were computationally practical to create a bespoke bundle for every user, they could obfuscate your entire page into, in, into oblivion and make it completely unintelligible. So Brave's concern was a lot about the statefulness of this generating a unique website for the, for the individual viewer. Bundling reduces the cost of scrambling the URLs by making it stateless to generate a new bundle per, per user. Um, but otherwise, the, the site has to remember, oh, to this user, I told them this thing. And so to scramble the URLs, it would have to like associate several requests and responses and so they were concerned that this would be a change in the, the economics. I want to note, it's also at the bottom of the document, my work here is now being funded by IO, by Adblock Plus, uh, to, because they're concerned about the same thing. So we want bundling to happen. It's important for the web, but also for it to be within the important, uh, you know, privacy and content blocking and user choice constraints that are, that are pretty key for the web. Sorry, Bradley. Sure. So I think the only thing that seems like it needs direct influence here is what you had with service workers and origins. Um, I don't think we can really separate those entirely from some kind of ECMAScript hook. Um, so to put this in somewhat perspective with the path restrictions, we, we would need to agree upon some kind of scoping mechanism. I know Dino, Node, and the web all have three different scoping mechanisms for how loading works. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I thought this would be all at the fetch level. I don't really understand how this fits into well, it comes down to the resolve, I believe. So what we did was we exposed our scoping mechanism, for example, in Node, and it, it, it works similarly. It has the idea of origins and it has the idea of paths. But in order to get that working in policies, we actually have the resolution alter at each level of that. And so if we are going through, let's say the compartment API, uh, there needs to be some way to define what a uh, boundary is for the compartments to swap behavior on. I'm sure we could write something by hand in user space. I don't think it would be practical to do so. So let's say we do implement a bundle let's say it is on a single origin, example.com. And let's say that that bundle is actually a subpath on that. We need to actually either honor the URL semantics, which I don't think uh, we're going to be able to go down that road, or have a way for compartments to define more than just a referrer, but a scope of a module. And the scope most likely would be some kind of collection. But so let me be more specific about this path restriction. I was picturing that we would say that we have this bundle, which is a, a URL, and we literally require things that the bundle purports to contain to be prefixed by that URL. So this prefix string, I mean, the, the alternative is to say it's the enclosing directory. That's what service worker does. Um, literally be prefixed by the bundle is a, is a tighter constraint, slight, slightly tighter. Uh, and it's, I don't know, you don't have to do as much URL parsing in JavaScript to, to enforce it. Um, I don't know if that changes things for you. I wanted to. Oh, mention. that would mean that for things like CDNs, they would need to support directories with the same name as files, correct? Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that CDNs would have to do. 
it's not a simple proposal because the idea I is I don't know how this is going to work on file is what I'm starting to get at the file protocol. Uh, oh, um, that's an interesting point. Wait, I, in Unix, you can have a directory with the same name as a file, right? It's just Linux, it's, it's, it's Windows that you it can have? work on Mac at least. Oh, okay. In Linux uh, and I mean, Unix in general, you uh, names are unique within a directory. You're, the type is the directory. If you have a type, you know, suffix like you do on Windows, well, then that's a different name. Well, that's a good point. This was kind of an unimportant part of the proposal. You can picture these being side by side instead of nested within. Mm -hmm. That's that's not too important. Um, I do know whatever prefix scheme is used here. That seems fine. Uh, that would also mean that within a given bundle, you're going to need to be able to resolve everything relatively. So does this mean you can't escape your bundle with you know a directory access traversal up past it? So oh, uh, you can. So that's one of the FAQs here. The Bundles are not isolated execution context. They can make arbitrary network requests. The isolation unit in HTML is more like the document. And so this is some of the sub resources that are loaded in the document. The idea would be that uh, the idea would be that all of the things that are inside of the scoped directory that's listed would be served by the bundle. But if you, you know, dot, dot out of that, or if you just reference an absolute URL that's outside of that, that's fine. I've heard requests for a way of running pages that's limited to the bundle, but that's, I feel like that's, um, you know, something we could handle after we get the basic bundle loading worked out. Okay. I'm trying to think here. Uh, it's a lot to take in. Um. Um, there's also taking a step back. Uh, there's uh, there's also the matter of the archive format for the bundle. Uh, do you have discussion of the archive format here? Oh, Daniel, yes, in a different document. Let me open that up. Is it is in as they say in NASA, uh, a satellite mission that involves a new launch motor is actually a launch motor mission. Um. <laughs> so yeah, the bundle format. So this is something that Google's been developing, and I have my little like fork of it. Uh, and I really like a lot of the design decisions that that Jeffrey Yaskin made, but I also have my own design decisions that I wanted to make slightly differently. So, you know, it uses CBOR, you know, the, the binary format that IETF uses for a lot of specifications. There's actually an IETF working group, WPAC working group, that is developing this binary format, but their charter is all mixed up with sign exchange. So I, I'm not really sure what to do, actually. I, mm -hmm. I proposed to them, what if you just focused on this file format and not sign exchange? And I don't, I don't know whether they'll go for it. Anyway, um, it has a section-based architecture. So if you're familiar with the WebAssembly binary format, you'll find a lot of familiar stuff, you know, magic number, version number, and then you have sections. And sections each have a name. So you have like a directory of sections. There are two key sections that are used here, index and resources. An index, um, you know, based on the the, URL or the, or the path, it provides a mapping from these paths to um, indexes in, in the resources. And then the resources section has metadata about each section and then a, a payload. And so the metadata on the web would probably be HTTP headers. It's likely that the set of HTTP headers that's usable in this context would be restricted. Um, the use of headers here is something that 
might not make sense in all environments. So maybe it makes sense in Node, but maybe it doesn't make sense in Mudable, for example. But I think the, the overall binary format would make sense more broadly. And then uh, there could be extra sections for, for certain advanced uses, but I don't think those come up in, in this um, loading case that I was writing up. Yeah, I don't think that Modable is going to be relevant in this particular case. Or, or the, the archive format isn't relevant to Modable because they're they already have an archive format and it's an executable. <laughs> question, question regarding what we're looking at here. Is this a Seabor array or a Seabor dictionary? The resource bundle, the top level thing. Uh, I'm not a Seabor expert. I just skimmed oh. some... Oh, it's it's just like JSON in in this context. Like, it's, I'm wondering, like, is this ordered or is this unordered? The resource bundle it's ordered because you want that length at the end. We went over this with web bundles. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's ordered. So the so you mentioned about Monable wanting executables. Its length at the end is exactly so that you can have one of these self-extracting executable that has a resource bundle in it. Not clear <laughs> we need that to ship on the, on the web that way, but you know, it's just eight bit bytes. And I see. Well, I mean, that settles that. I mean, we know that zip is not acceptable and we know that tar is not acceptable. So we're definitely in the territory of inventing a new bundle format. And Mark, incidentally, Seabor is also one of the options for, um, as a, as a message pack alternative, as a basis for uh, a cap TP. I, was just I would recommend it actually. Uh, say again. Oh, I said, I, I would recommend it. If you're looking at like, you know, structured binary formats, Seabor is like, it's popular enough in IETF that I think it, I think it has like, it is the center of gravity unless you have a very compelling reason not to use it, um, it would be a good choice. Yeah, I see more seems pretty nice. It's easy to play around with it and come up with valid, correct things that you're talking about. And so, yeah, so tar, tar and zip, like maybe there's some way that we could make tar work, but we would have to, you know, because tar has kind of extensible metadata in, in some ugly sense, but like none of the existing tools for working with tar would, would know about that. And also this has an index at the front, like it's, so it's a random access data structure. Which, yes, which is the strength that zip has, but zip has its own security downfalls. Right, but also this streams better than zip because the index can be placed at the beginning. Yeah, zip has got a central directory at the end and it gets really confusing, you do three jumps to find the first file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, well, good thing we're not using hard drives anymore, at least, but we have streaming through through the web. And, you know. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, so in summary, this is a launch motor project. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and also uh, touches so 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 this is a hard effort um, because you have to stick the landing on both ends, um, both the uh, oh uh, it, there's more ends than that I mean there's this this format there's like the servers there's the tooling there's the browsers mm -hmm. uh, there's and then there's the like harsh resistance from many different corners at the same time. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and and yet it's still valuable. Uh, is only a question, and then it's only. Six, I think that it has failed up to this point because the value and the cost were not quite well aligned enough. I think it would be a different story if it were possible to do one of these pieces and get it popular first. You know, like if if I needed to invent Jason in order to make something work, uh, then it would probably be better to just try to get Jason popular first, right? <laughs> Which piece could we go with? I mean, I feel like having something ship in browsers will will increase the use of, the popularity of it, but uh, we would need to solve also like the versioning problem 
which I have here with these chunk IDs that I guess we can talk about some other time, as well as the code splitting problem. I mean, they're both handled by these kind of chunk IDs. So, I mean, there was a proposal made by, by Google to just load a whole resource bundle, uh, but I don't think that would be useful enough. That's here. Yeah. Oh, it might be. It might be that there's a slice of this that would work in collaboration with the CDN, where it might be possible to uh, to to propose an arc a web archival format that would be useful for transport on the the edge between the CDN and a server, uh, and that might that might be a way to to lower the activation energy of the of the problem as a whole. The problem, but in any case, my opinion doesn't matter. I think the only person in this room who has an opinion that's of any value on this topic is probably Michael's. <laughs> so, um, Daniel, there's a pr proposal you just pulled up, but also isn't there also a web package proposal? It seems like there, there are several proposals now that are trying to eat at this from different aspects and, and what kind of coordination do you know, are you aware of that's going on with these? Uh, I'm in close coordination with the, uh, you know, like with Jeffrey and Joav, we, we chat about this all the time. Uh, I take your point that we're not, do, I'm not doing a good job presenting this clearly. So I'm working on this, this write up and then I'm, my plan would be to make like the appropriate cross references explaining the relationship between all the different things. Uh, but you know, sure. there's a lot of iteration that has to go on with the, you know, with this part, with like what's the actual kind of manifest format, and that's that's one thing because that's still unclear. Made made my documents pretty uh, iterating. -y. I'm I'm I apologize about the load there. <clears throat> so a, a no no aspersion intended. Um, I, I I do have some concerns that you know this is encompassing so many different technologies to make it you know, available. And the other thing, um, despite Gray's assertion, I do have some primary privacy concerns. I don't know who you've been talking to in the WebKit team. Um, and I haven't, I haven't discussed this with anybody, but I, I do have privacy concerns that we've already discussed in this call. Oh, I'd, I'd like to hear them. I don't know if you wanna discuss it in this call or, or out. We had a thread on the WebKit Slack and that's all kind of, public, so that's why I was kind of referring to it in this, in this call. I talked to Ryosuke and also John, John Weilander uh, raised, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but he raised, um, he raised some concerns. Um, some of them seem to be about things that I, I just agreed with him about, like that we need to continue to use, um, you know, split caches, I completely agree. And I didn't understand if they were still like open questions, but there's kind of a, you're right, there's kind of like a big barrage of, of things. So uh, it's, un it's understandable. Okay. You want, how do you want to be in touch about this? Well, so since I'm from the JavaScript core side of things, I, I am not the probably the best person to talk about. I mean, certainly there's some JavaScript issues here, but the bigger issues is, is the, you know, the web engine, you know, HTML resources and all that stuff. And, and then also the whole, you know, what, what happens on, on, on tooling and server side. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'm part of the Apple WebKit team, but I'm not the right person. John and Ryosuke and, and, and probably a maybe some others would be the right people to, to engage. If you're already engaged with them, that's, those are the right people. Well, the conversation kind of trailed off. And so I got the impression, I mean, what, one, of the, one of the concerns that Ryosuke raised was that doing something at the fetch level will have higher overhead, which is something that Chrome people didn't agree with. So I thought that prototyping would be a reasonable way to investigate that concern, which seems like a legitimate concern. Uh, and then at the end of it, it seemed like privacy concerns were really about things that I'm not proposing that, you know, like the, the Chrome web bundles were, were problematic. And so 
and ultimately, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to bother people too much. So I didn't, you know, when the conversation dropped off, I didn't like keep pinging people all the time. I don't know. So if you how would you, how would you characterize resource bundles versus the, the web bundles proposals? Are they competing or are they, um, are they They're definitely not competing? We're talking about the same thing. Uh, so, so why, I, why a separate proposal then? So like a separate name expresses that we're making a, a break from, uh, you know, the problematic aspects of, of the web bundles proposal, like about permitting personalization and tying into signed exchange. Uh, I could just keep calling it web bundles. Um, I don't really know how to do this, this branding thing, but it seems like everyone decided web bundles are, are a bad thing. And I want to express that it's not controlled by, by Google and things like that. But they're not, they're not competing. I have that written in this document. I wrote like, what's the relationship with? Is the HackMD um, IO the proper um, place on the web to refer to this? It, that, that document talks about a WeCG resource bundles URL that doesn't work. Sorry, this is, this is really early. Uh, I can get back to you once I have the draft fully done. Um, okay, that, that, that'd be good because um, I, I will then uh, put, uh, you know, circulate that URL in, in our, our internal tracker of, of standards proposals and we can discuss it in one place. So, um, yeah, if you, whenever you can make that available, that'd be good. Um, and my, this is Michael speaking, I like that to be on some standards bodies, um, you know, GitHub repository and not in somebody's personal because um, it's less likely to move. Yeah, I mean. And it has higher visibility. The, the idea is to put it in WICG slash resource bundles, uh, but I need a full first draft before I get it there and I was just sharing my, my draft in progress. The idea is not to circulate this HackMD URL. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I, I, th I think it would be open about, about things. Yeah, I think it would be good to call time on this meeting. It has been an engaging topic. Um, thank, you, thank you for bringing this. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah and, and good luck. I think I think this is the right direction for the problem. Okay, thanks thanks everyone for for talking about it and sorry for going over time. Uh, no worries. I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>